Yes, the thumbnail to this video is a bit of an exaggeration because Hitler wasn't on LSD, but he was on everything else pretty much. And his troops were also on things like meth. And so as a result, they were seeing things, uh, some of them who overdosed. And, uh, you know, people were dying of heart attacks and gone as well else. And we're going to get to it because that is, in fact, the Patreon question asking about the troop performance in the Second World War based on the on the drugs that they were taking. But before we get to that, I just want to address something else here because there are other videos on YouTube and other sources as well, which are pushing this particular narrative that Madman Hitler made no good decisions and that Madman Hitler can't be understood and National Socialism can't be understood because it's just full of drugs. Drugs, 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 drugs. It's the excuse which I've been tackling over and over again. You know, Madman Hitler and now the variant of that, which is Madman Druggy Hitler. Um, so I want to address that in this video because it's actually kind of a false narrative. Now, people will jump to, you know, the defense and say, well, Hitler was on drugs. Like, yeah, but when was he on drugs? That's the question we need to be asking because he wasn't on drugs throughout the Second World War. And again, people will jump to, no, he started taking drugs in 1936. No, he didn't. And again, people on the YouTubes and even some authors are pushing this narrative and the evidence doesn't support it. So I'm going to, and I don't know whether they're pushing this because they just made mistakes or we're using imprecise language. I don't know. But whatever reason, they're pushing this narrative and people are getting that impression. And I've seen it in the comments on my videos. So for example, uh, I had a recent video on Turkey and uh, I was discussing the events in 1940, 41, 42. Should uh, Hitler have gone through Turkey to get to the oil? And one user was like, oh, well, Hitler didn't make any good decisions because he was on drugs. No, not in that time period, he wasn't. And then in last week's Stalingrad video, episode 16, we got to the September period and I explained how Hitler had to go at Yodel and fell out with his high commanders, including uh, Franz Halder, which I've explained millions of times. You know, these generals made mistakes and blamed it all on Hitler. Madman Hitler. Well, Madman Hitler, again, people were in the comments section saying, oh, wait a second, Tick. You know, the reason why Hitler had to go at Yodel and so on was because he was on drugs, right? I have numerous times in, th I can't even list the number of videos now, where I have tackled the Hitler, Madman Hitler myth, because it is a myth. Hitler, even in my Curlin series, I showed that, okay, yeah, the war, the side of war was changed. Hitler was making... Um, the best decisions that he could make, which sometimes were mistakes, blah, 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 but at least he was making rational decisions. And at least we can understand why it wasn't like he just made random decisions that were completely unfathomable. We can actually see why he chose to make those decisions. Now, if you read somebody like Werner Haupt, you never get a decision. It's like, Hitler made a bad decision and we don't know why. And the reason is because he didn't make that decision. It was somebody else who made that decision and Werner Haupt is trying to cover for it. And this is the same with all the other... Nazi generals, they're all trying to blame everything on Hitler, and now they've got a new excuse, which is that, okay, it's it's druggy Hitler as well. So it wasn't just Madman Hitler, it was Madman druggy Hitler. Well, I'm sorry, it doesn't work out. And, of course, because I'm disputing the idea that Madman Hitler was Madman Hitler, of course, people will be in the comments going, well, you're only defending him because you love him, you're a Nazi, or a fascist, or some other name we don't quite understand because we can't define it, even though you have defined it. Um, so... <laughs> I want to just confirm, no, I'm not a Nazi, not a fascist, blah, blah, blah. The reason why I am against the idea of Madman Hitler isn't because I love Hitler. I don't, I think he's an evil person, right? The reason I'm defending him in this sense, in the Madman Hitler sense, is because of history. What is history? History is the study of the human condition. It is not the study of the past. I've been over this before. It's not the study of the past. We cannot go back in time and look at Hitler and be like, all right, you know, and study him. We can't do that because he's gone, right? All we have of Hitler and anybody else in history is the records of the past. We are not studying the past itself. We are studying what the past has given us, the records of the past. So we're looking at diaries, reports, you know, swords that you dig out the ground. You've got castles, that sort of thing. It's, it's the thing from the past that are recorded and we now have that in our possession. Now, what are these records? These records, no matter what they are, are created by human hands. You write something down with your hand, right? You forge the steel of the sword, you build the castle. So we are studying things that have been produced 
by humans in the past. And everything that's produced by human hands is worked. You know, these hands are, are directed by human brains. And so what we're doing with history is studying the human brain. We are studying the human condition. History is the study of the human condition. It's the study of ourselves. And so if we get this wrong, if we come out with, well, Madman Hitler, and it's a completely stupid idea, we're going to jump to false conclusions. And then we have that danger that history will repeat itself. And the last thing we want is history to repeat itself. So the reason why I'm against the idea of Madman Hitler is because the Madman Hitler myth and or the Madman Druggy Hitler myth is this idea that Hitler is a mytholo mythological uh, creature that we cannot understand. He's like a demon or a, a devil incarnate. Like, he's just mad. Like, we just cannot understand this guy because he's crazy. No other human is like this person. He's just insane, right? That's the fundamental premise of the myth. What I'm saying is that, no, Hitler was a human being, right? What does that imply? Well, Hitler is, if Hitler is a human being and not a beast, not a demon, not something that, you know, a myth of some sort, which we can't understand, if he was actually physical, he had, you know, a dog called Blondie, he uh, was a vegetarian, he uh, didn't smoke, he didn't drink until 1943, you know, he took drugs, he actually, you know, he, he was a physical and you know, being and, and had thoughts and had feelings and had girlfriends that had committed suicide uh, and a wife at the very end and he shot himself, right? So the, he is a human being. If we accept this, what we're going to have to also accept is the idea that, hold on, if Hitler's a human being, that means that humans, humanity, have the potential to do bad things. Now, they have the potential to do evil things terrible evil things horrors that are of unimaginable horror and so maybe humanity isn't the perfect wonderful thing that maybe we think it is we can actually see oh no humans all of us perhaps have the potential to be bad potential to have we have a dark side or if we believe in certain flawed things like hitler did maybe like you know the, we accept the idea that race exists even though it's a pseudoscientific thing and doesn't exist, as I've explained in a previous video, or we believe in certain ideologies, we could also end up like Hitler. And this is how I've explained in the past. If you accept two or three principles, you will come to Hitler's conclusion, because it's... And those principles are flawed, but the point is, if you accept them, you will come to Hitler's conclusion. That's why many people did, because they accepted those three or four fundamental, fundamentally flawed ideas, and that's why they became uh, Nazis. You know, that's what happens. And so what I'm saying is that Hitler is human and we need to take a look at ourselves and, and look at him and go, where did he go wrong? How do we prevent this from happening again? What, what are those pr fundamental principles that we have to gr get our heads around and understand so that we don't fall into the same trap that Hitler did and end up in the same conclusion that Hitler did and then we have another Hitler, right? If we don't learn from the past, if Hitler's just a madman, we have the danger of coming to this again because we're ignoring the problem that is inherent with Hitler, right? And this is why we have ignored the problem. I think we have. That's why we're getting many more Hitlers, Stalins, Pol Pots, Klaus Schwabs of the World Economic Forum, who currently is calling for a great reset of the Judeo-capitalist system and a Fourth Reich Industrial Revolution. Now is the historical moment, the time not only to fight severe virus, but to shape the system. We can build a new social contract, particularly integrating the next generation. We can change our behavior to be in harmony with nature again. And we can make sure that the technologies of the fourth industrial revolution are best utilized to provide us with better lives. In short, we need a great reset. Yes, there are evil people in this world, and this is why we haven't learnt from history. By the way, if you want to learn more about Klaus Schwab and his economic forum, uh, you should check out Computing Forever. There's a load of people who've done videos on it, but Computing Forever has done a good job with Klaus Schwab, so I'd recommend his videos. Links in the description. Um, but yeah, so this is where I'm refusing to accept the idea that Hitler, Madman Hitler, and we can't understand him. I think we can understand him. In fact, a lot of the time, 
he actually made rational decisions. Okay, maybe there were mistakes or whatever, but at least they were rational. And his ideology is perfectly, you know, if you accept the as I say, if you if you believe in race, which doesn't exist, but if you believe in race, racism, uh, you know, certain other elements, you will come to the same conclusions that Hitler did, because rationally it, it can, you know if you accept those from the flawed principles it makes sense and i've explained this pretty previously so that's why i'm i'm standing by it's not because i like hitler it's nothing to do with that it's because i like the idea that humanity can overcome its problems so hitler is human the nazis are evil but they're not necessarily insane necessarily um now let's look at the history then so the nazi drug thing has its uh, beginnings in the Weimar Republic era. Uh, IG Farben was founded in the mid-1920s and basically becomes a uh, chemicals manufacturer. It creates synthetic oil, which is fundamental to the Nazi war machine, as I've documented previously, but it also creates uh, hardcore drugs, let's put it that way, uh, cocaine and other things like that. And so the Weimar years are just full of drug users. That's why the Nazis and the communists, who are definitely not the same, uh, both came to the conclusion that the, um, you know, that the drugs were a problem because obviously to a Nazi or a Marxist who wants to keep the uh, Aryan workers uh, pure blooded and all that, and they also think that uh, drugs are part of the Judeo bourgeoisie, you know, these they want to purify the blood or the working class and uh, not have them be corrupted by the poison of Marxism or Judaism. And so they are both against the idea of drugs and so presented themselves as anti-drug. And you see this because Hitler was a teetotaler during this period. He apparently threw his last pick, uh, packet of cigarettes into uh, the Danube, I think it was. There's a debate about that, but let's just go with it. And also he uh, didn't eat meat and uh, he didn't drink until 1943. And there's a whole load of other things that Hitler did to present himself as a teetotaler, which is why he had stomach problems uh, by the time he gets to the mid 1930s, because just like uh, Mussolini and just like many other people, uh, Hitler refused to eat meat. Mussolini did actually eat some meat, but not enough. And he was basically on, you know, the Mediterranean diet along with um, Mussolini. So they only ate uh, greens, pasta and uh, salads, which is why they both had stomach issues. Anyone who's been a vegan knows that after a few years, you end up with stomach problems, uh, pains, etc. And the reason why is because we are not herbivores. We are, well, we're omnivores, but we're, we're leaning to the carnivore side. And so after so many years, you hit what's known as the wall. There's other names for it. Well, you just can't go on anymore. And and Hitler hit that wall somewhere in the mid-1930s. And he turns to a doctor called Morel, who then starts giving him injections. And then we get this idea, oh, well, there you go, Satek. Hitler was on drugs in 1936. And other videos have said this. And, and no, what he got injected with in 1936 was vitamins and glucose, so sugar. Right now, yes, sugar is a drug. You can get a sugar rush, <laughs> a sugar high, but it's not really what we would class as a hardcore drug. And um, yeah, it can kill you if you have too much of it. It can make you fat. You know, you can you can get dependent on it, I guess. But it's not what we would consider a hardcore drug. And vitamins, I don't think, are, can also be classed as hardcore drugs. So it's right that Hitler started taking injections in 1936 or medications, or maybe you could even call a vaccine, but he can't really say it was because he was taking drugs in 1936. He wasn't. Basically before every single speech he made, or, you know, if he had to address the troops or whatever, he would get an injection of sugar and he'd be hyped up and he'd be ready to give that speech. He would give him energy. And the vitamins also helped with his bowel trouble um, because again, you know, he wasn't getting all the nutrients he needed from his all uh, anti-meat diet. So let's address the Patreon question, which is asking about the troops, and then we'll come back to Hitler later on in the war. So this is the Patreon question. So Mr. Ferguson, whose first name I hope isn't this, but if it is, I'm sorry, says, how much did Pavitin and the psychological factor of being superior boost the Wehrmacht early on in the war? I mean, everything is so mental in a person's life and confidence goes a long way. 
I've always wondered how affected the German army was mentally after Barbarossa and Foul Blau. The second part about Pavitin, aka methamphetamine, I've read and heard that the German army, especially during the Battle of France, were juiced up, which was what allowed them to drive days on days in their tanks and fly a ridiculous amount of sorties. Spellcheck. Hopefully I was able to articulate my question properly. Great question, and yes, the German Wehrmacht was on methamphetamine in the form of Pavitin, which is a, a hardcore drug, let's put it that way. And you, what you do is you take these tablets. I think the recommended dose was like one or two a day, and they were taking a lot more than that. Uh, and uh, it wasn't officially given to the troops during Poland, but a lot of them had it. Uh, a lot of the German people had it at that point. Uh, but it was officially given to them during the uh, France campaign in 1940. And Uhler and others make the case that the German uh, panzer units and so on were on Pavitin. And so as a result of that, this is blitzed, by the way, blitzed by Uhler, which is the main source where most of this information comes from. And which is why everyone's discussing this now. It's because of this guy, Uhler. Uhler says that the panzer divisions were all on Pavitin, and so they raced to the coast, and that's the reason why, um, because they were able to stay awake due to the drugs. There's an element to this, and, and Beaver, Anthony Beaver, also says that this is the case, and there's a few others, but it's not the only factor, and Military History Visualize, in a quick video he did, uh, outline, outline this and said, no, wait a second, there's logistics, there's other factors too, and I agree with him, I don't think... I mean, yeah, maybe it was a factor, maybe it was an influence, but I don't think it was the main factor as to why they got to the coast. Uh, but let's just go with it. Okay, yeah, okay, it enhanced their performance, supposedly, kept them awake, and so they were able to drive a bit further. Okay, but then Uhler and others, it's not just him, jumped to the conclusion that the reason Hitler stopped the tanks at Dunkirk, or before Dunkirk, was because he was on drugs. Oh wait, no he wasn't. So Uhler himself doesn't say Hitler was on drugs, but other people have said it. And uh, But Uhler does say that the drugs influenced it because Goering was on drugs. Goering was on cocaine, and so Goering shot himself in the arm or whatever he did, <laughs> got cocaine into his system. He then goes to Hitler with this brilliant plan of stopping the tanks and bombing the British at Dunkirk, and Madman Hitler, again, just went, yeah, okay, that's a great idea, Goering. <laughs> like, what? Like, it doesn't, it doesn't even make any sense, and the reason why it doesn't make any sense is because the sources are vague, right? The sources have been lost, aka they're still in the Royal Archives. I've got my theory as to why the, the Hitler stopped the tanks, or theories as to why Hitler stopped the tanks. Other people have got theories too. Whatever. The point is, it's not because of the drugs. If Goering was on drugs, and he probably was, that's fine, why would Hitler, who's not on drugs at this point, or not on hardcore drugs, you know, sugar's a drug, okay, Hitler's not on hardcore drugs at this point, why would Hitler accept Madman Goering's idea? Like, it doesn't make any sense, and again, you have to fall back on the idea that Hitler's a madman, and I don't think, I think there's other reasons as to why, and other people do too, so that's not, the drugs is not the reason why he stopped the tanks, but Ulla and others are suggesting that that is the reason. Then we get to Barbarossa 1941, and the troops are on Pavitin even more so, I think, by this point. But even though Pavitin may have helped, let's say, in the first few weeks of the campaign, the problem is with Pavitin is that after a, a while of taking the drug, you end up sleep deprived and you have to then crash out and recover from the drug. And even Uhler in his book has to say and shows the, some of the German reports saying, yep, yeah, actually, that is exactly what happened. Pavitin, you got one guy, one of the Germans saying, Pavitin doesn't help us in this particular conflict. It kept you awake mercilessly. We knew it was addictive and that it had side effects. Psychoses, nervous excitement, a loss of strength. And in Russia, it was a war of attrition, positional warfare. In such circumstances, Pavitin was of no use. It just exhausted you. You eventually had to catch up on the rest you missed. Sleep deprivation simply didn't bring any tactical advantages anymore. And with the idea that the German soldiers thought they were superior, that might have been the case early on in Barbarossa, but there is evidence that by the end of Barbarossa and the beginning of 1942, 
The German soldiers no longer believed this. Before long, the German soldier realised the Russian fighting man was infinitely better than his superiors would like him to believe. With this realisation, admitted Adam Schick, my dream of going home soon receded. Robert Kershaw in his book War Without Garlands, Operation Barbarossa 1941-42, great book, he explains how by the end of 1941 the German soldier was at the end of his tether. Any amount of confidence that they might have had in 1941 was gone by 1942. That's why you see and hear reports in 1942 during the Fallblad campaign when the Germans are successful initially that, oh, they're getting their confidence back a little bit, and then they end up in Stalingrad. So that confidence is only there when they're winning. When they're not winning, that confidence fades. They may still have thought themselves superior, and that's perhaps why they were very confident and whatever in France and Poland before that, and even Barbarossa, but by the time you get to the end of Barbarossa and into 1942, I, I think that superiority idea may have started to disappear. And then we get to Stalingrad in 1942, where I, this is me now speaking, I suspect the Germans were on drugs, and I thought so before this, but um, I have no direct evidence of this. However, it does make sense that they would be, and the reason why is because when you actually look at the reports and whatever else, the Germans are fighting right up until about 12 o'clock at night-ish, and then they're starting the next day's combat at 3 o'clock in the morning. And they're doing this day after day after day after day, week after week, month after month. The campaign is seven months, is seven months long. And so a normal human being on three hours of sleep or less, because if you think about it, if they stop at, let's say, 12 o'clock, and they start fighting at three o'clock, then that implies they must have got, unless they got up out of the, you know, oh, I'm awake now, let's go. Uh, they would have had to get up a bit earlier than that, maybe have some breakfast or something. So really they're only operating on like two hours sleep, <laughs> which you might be able to do in the short term, but long term, is that really sustainable? I, I question it. So again, Pavitin may have been a, a contributing factor here, and I suspect it actually was. It does make sense. When you get to like 1942, 1943, 1944, the question then becomes, were the troops then suffering from the long-term effects of being on Pavitin? And my answer to that would probably be yes to the troops that were still alive. Because let's not forget, <laughs> a lot of troops that, let's say, entered the conflict in 1941 were not there by 1945. <laughs> Many of them have been either killed, captured, wounded, whatever else. So, yeah, some of the long-term guys who were on Pavitin may have been struggling by the end, but I also think there's a lot of new recruits coming along who probably weren't. So that's my take on the Wehrmacht, and even Ula doesn't really mention the, the Wehrmacht post-1941, so it's hard to say, you know, he can't even come to the conclusion that, yeah, the, the Germans were on the last legs because of the drugs, They can't, he couldn't do that. So I don't think I can either. And I suspect that that wasn't really the case. But what about Hitler? Because last time we mentioned him, it was 1940, and he wasn't on hardcore drugs. So what's going on here? Well, in 1941, they launch Operation Barbarossa, and things at first seem to do well, which is why uh, Halder announces victory in the first few weeks of the campaign. This turns out to be false, because the Soviet Union doesn't collapse, and then they start... Uh, breaking down. The Blitzkrieg breaks down. They run out of oil in the in the autumn of 1941. I've covered that in previous videos. But they also run out of other things like manpower, determination, and also just mental capabilities. The German generals, the German troops are on their last legs physically and mentally. And there's a lot of reports about them just suffering from depression and as well else. And the high commander's also suffering as well from nervous strain, including Hitler. And there is a report in, in the autumn period where Hitler has diarrhea, he has a fever, he's shivering, he's in pain, he may have had dysentery, it's not confirmed. But either way, the vitamin injections and the glucose injections that morale was giving him were no longer working. And so... Morale started giving him steroids and hormone supplements, injections. These hormones came from animals, uh, pigs, for example. But again, steroids, testosterone, other hormones, these aren't hardcore drugs. 
So again, even in 1941, it's not right to say that Hitler was on hardcore drugs, because he literally wasn't. Now, did glucose, did hormones, did steroids affect him? Yes. And so it, by 1942, even though he's not on hardcore drugs, his physical health is beginning to decline. That doesn't mean that he was affected mentally at that point. But that doesn't stop Uhler and others saying, well, OK, order number 45, which was Hitler's uh, decision to split Arbogut South into two parts and send them off both in different directions, and is potentially a major problem for the 1942 campaign, that decision was made because Hitler was mentally disturbed or whatever. And Uhler actually implies this, even though Uhler himself doesn't say that Hitler was on hardcore drugs at this moment in time. So I don't know why he said that. And as I've explained in the Stalingrad series and, others, and the Foul Blau video, no, I, actually, this was a rational decision that Hitler made. It was a mistake, but it was understandable as to why he made it because he genuinely thought he'd won the campaign. It was just a t case of mopping up. So was it really hardcore drugs that he wasn't really taking? Was that the reason why he made that decision? No. But yet, Uhler and others imply that that is the case. Uhler also backs up his argument with quotes from the German generals, like Manstein, who wasn't even there, or Franz Halder, which we shouldn't be quoting from because that guy just hates Hitler and blames everything on Hitler. So, of course... You know, he's going to quote from that. So, uh, again, this doesn't, it doesn't add up. Then, Uhler says about Yodel in 1942, September time. And I've covered this in the previous episode last week. Uh, and, again, Uhler suggests, oh, yeah, the reason why he had a go at, at uh, Yodel, and he's not the only one, there's other people saying this too, is because of the dr Hitler wasn't on drugs at this point. Hitler wasn't on drugs at this point, so it's not possible to say the reason why he had to go at Yodel and Halder and so on in 1942 was because of the drugs, because he wasn't on them, right? So again, this, this argument doesn't work. But it is true that by late 1942, as the Stalingrad campaign is collapsing and as 1943 comes along, Hitler's health physically is deteriorating. And I still think this is because of his poor diet, He's not eating meat. And I also think the hormone supplements were also having an effect at this point. But again, not hard hardcore drugs. His mind is still fine. It's just a case of he's physically getting weaker. And so he gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And then by mid-1943, it becomes a real problem. And so on the 18th of July, 1943, after the decision to withdraw at Kursk had already been made, so this is way after, this is after Kursk now, Hitler is given his first hardcore drug, which is Ukadol, and this is an opium. So I want to make it absolutely blatantly clear. 18th of July, 1943, is the first time Hitler takes hardcore drugs. Before that, no. But from 18th of July, 1943, to the about the 2nd of January, 1945, or even a bit further than that, Hitler is on hardcore drugs, and so you can then make the case Hitler was an addict and that some of his decisions may have been made or influenced by the drugs. Although, again, I would look at other factors first. As I've done in my Curlin series, you can see actually Hitler's still making rational decisions at this point. But yes, you can say Hitler was on drugs at that point. Hardcore drugs. However, in 1945, or actually it's a little bit before that, Brit the British bombers bomb the drug factories and they blow them up. And so Morel, Hitler's doctor, runs out of drugs. Uh, and the last time Hitler takes hardcore drugs like Ukadal is on the 2nd of January 1945. He does get other drugs and stuff for a little bit longer, but by about late February 1945, he's out and he's suffering from withdrawal symptoms from then right until his death. Again, yeah, you can say there's the influence there, but what I would also say is that throughout this entire period, drugs or no drugs, Hitler is making rational decisions. And some of you might go, no, no, that can't be true, not from 1943 to 1943. No, I would say it is. And even Ulla confirms this. The goals and motives, the ideological fantasy world, were not the result of drugs, but established much earlier. 
Hitler did not murder because he was living in a haze, quite the contrary. He remained sane until the end. His drug use did not impinge on his freedom to make decisions. Hitler was always the master of his senses, and he knew exactly what he was doing. He acted always in an alert and cold-blooded way. Within his system, based from the beginning on intoxication and a flight from reality, he acted systematically and with terrible consistency to the end. He was anything but insane. So yes, Hitler was a druggie. And yes, their Wehrmacht were druggies too. But <laughs> we need to not jump to stupid conclusions and then say, well, the war was won or lost because of the drugs. Or that uh, Hitler had a go at Franz Halder and Yodel in 1942 because he was on drugs, right? No, he had a go at Yodel and Halder and Guderian and Manstein and all the other ones because they sucked, right? They were poor generals who pretended that they were amazing and wrote memoirs that said how great they were, but in reality, they weren't as good as they made themselves out to be. That's the reason why, okay? So, again, let's not jump to silly conclusions like Hitler was not human, and that's why we can never understand him and history won't repeat itself. Like, no, history will repeat itself if we have that conclusion. We need to realise that if we do not learn from the past, if we do not understand Hitler and actually dig down to the core of his beliefs and fully rationalise and realise what he was saying and why he was saying it, there will be more Hitlers. And in fact, there are more Hitlers. As I said before, Klaus Schwab. So stop not learning the lessons of the past. Learn your history. Stay inside. Save lives. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>